Introduction by Lon Milo Duquette The ink is one of the most recognized spiritual symbols in the world. Revered quietly by 19th century esotericists, it bursts with psychedelic panache upon the expanding consciousness of the 20th century and the 1960s. Dangling from the necks of hippies, or splashed colorfully upon the sides of mishappen Volkswagen minivans, this ancient and sacred symbol came to represent in the consciousness of Western civilization, all things spiritually free and life-affirming. I recall stepping into the L.A. Free Press bookstore in Los Angeles in the summer of 1966 and seeing the strange cross-like symbol hanging next to peace sign medallions and Sanskrit alms. I asked the long-haired cashier in the blue work shirt, What is this cross? Is it the sign of Venus? He snapped back at me. No, man. It's an ink. It stands for free love, man. I bought one on the spot. I would soon learn the ink meant more than free love. Indeed, to the subculture of the 1960s, this looped cross symbolized the universal forces of goodness and justice, the righteous enemy of institutions and endeavors that bring death and destruction to humanity and our world. Like tie-dyed Van Helsings, we brandished the ink before us to repel the Dracula of the evil, war establishment, of that turbulent era. If any symbol on earth could hold such power, it is certainly the ink. Its antiquity cannot be measured, and no one today can say with certainty what its ultimate origin is. There is little doubt that the instrument by which the ancient Egyptians measured the rise and fall of the Nile, vital data for a culture that depended upon the seasonal flow of the river, was shaped like the ink. As important as that practical function was, however, the ink became profoundly more important as a religious symbol. In Egyptian art, the ink is pictured in the hands of the gods and held to the pharaoh's lips as if it were the breath of life itself. Its form, a not-so-subtle conjunction of the female and male generative organs, evokes the eternal powers of self-regeneration. With its oval head, outstretched arms, and slender stalk, it mirrors the human form. Indeed, ornate, ink-shaped hand mirrors have been found in tombs of the ancient Egyptians, as if to affirm the great truth that the secret of life can only be discovered through self-reflection. The Egyptian word for mirror is ink. Some believe the ink was the rod of Moses or Aaron, the Staff of Hermes, the archetype of the Caduceus. It might surprise you to learn that the ink is still sacred to Coptic Christians in Egypt, and the crux ansata, cross with a handle, is the source and inspiration of that most western of mystical symbols, the rosy cross. It should not surprise us, therefore, that the symbol of the ink is not limited to any one religion, or that it cannot be properly defined. Indeed, once a symbol is defined, it ceases to be a symbol and becomes an emblem that crystallizes a narrow idea into a dead form. A symbol is alive and ever-changing. It must remain an eternal mystery. It is the consensus among many modern esotericists that the ink was designed to be recognized by the ancient eye as a simple sandal strap. This is my favorite theory, for it suggests to me the secret that life is a journey each of us must make, one step at a time. It's simply a matter of going, a process of voluntary movement, a willed commitment to move on, move up, and become something greater than we are now. What a fitting symbol for the world's most respected and venerable publisher of esoteric literature. The diagrams in this chapter date, the ink finds its modern home among the symbols of the 60s subculture. Queen Nefertari holds a hand mirror or an ink. And that is it. Part 1. Origins of a Sacred Symbol. Chapter 1. The Circle and the Cross. 
The ink's long and complex history begins with its separate parts. The ink is, in essence, a conglomeration of elements of symbols common to many cultures and traditions. It combines two of the most ubiquitous and meaning-packed symbols in existence, the cross and the circle. A derivative of the traditional cross, the ink is sometimes called the crux ansata, Latin for cross with a handle. It is formed by placing a circle or loop above the T or Tau cross. Tau is the Greek letter T. The diagrams stated here in the book are architectural circle cross, 4th century Coptic, and the Greek Tau. The cross as intersection and opposition. The cross made its first appearances in cave markings thousands of years ago, before humans learned to paint and carve. Though its exact origin is unknown, it quickly became a symbol for all things that come in fours, the four cardinal directions, the four elements of life, the four seasons. There are scores of permutations of the cross, from the most basic primordial figure demonstrating orientation on a plane to the St. Andrew's cross to the swastika. The cross that comprises the bottom half of the ank is commonly known as the Tao. This is the Old Testament prefiguration of the Christian cross, which was known in Egypt as the sign that Israelites marked in blood to protect themselves against the nature god Yahweh, or Mercatante. The Tao was used all over the world by cultures as diverse as the pagans, the Druids, and the Christians, and was known variously as a symbol of the Tree of Life, of St. Philip, and of eternal life. The cross, as adopted by the Christian Church, often called the Latin cross, represented Jesus' crucifixion. In the diagrams of this section, we have a simple cross depicting orientation on a plane. The center the St. Andrew's Cross, and the right is the swastika. The second diagram on the left is the ink as the Staff of Moses, and on the right the Staff of Moses, bronze sculpture, Mount Nebu, Jordan. Clearly shows the shape of the ink. An ink mystery. The Bible tells us that the staff Moses carried as he led his people out of captivity in Egypt was topped with an ink. No one really knows why. Was Moses an early magician in one of the esoteric traditions that have come down to us today in a different form? Was he actually the pharaoh Akhenaten and therefore entitled to use the symbol? Or was he who the Bible says he is, a son of Israel? saved from a general massacre and destined to lead his people out of captivity? Perhaps the ink was a protective talisman. While the cross has taken on many meanings across many cultures, its basic significance is consistent in a dictionary of symbols, J.E. Serlot observes. The cross has been widely used as a graphic emblem very largely as a result of Christian influence, but equally on account of the basic significance of the sign, for it is clear that all basic notions, whether they are ideas or signs, have come about without the prompting of any cultural influence. The basic significance to which he refers concerns opposites, the vertical with the horizontal, the negative with the positive, but the cross also represents the intersection of forces. It is sometimes seen as the tree of life, its arms stretching out towards the heavens, or as an X. In signs of life, angels, Arian rites, oh, I'm sorry, angelus and Arian rites of the equal armed cross. It symbolizes the process of relationship and integration. This is a coupling, synthesizing, integrating, and balancing process. This process carries the need for connection to a creative project, to a group, to another person, or to oneself. It is the symbol that demonstrates integration and balanced connection. The illustrations on pages 12 through 21 give a partial representation of the many different forms. This symbol has taken over the centuries. The Old Rugged Ink and Other Crosses to Bear the brilliant psychologist Carl Jung put forth his belief that crosses are a key symbol for the creative process, 
which usually leads to a crossroads and a choice of artistic direction the creator must take. Each illustration here, I will give you the name of the crosses as depicted in the book. There is the Latin cross, which is a crossbar and is one-fourth down. The cross of Peter, crossbar, is three-fourths down. The cross of Patriarch, a short crossbar just below the top and a longer crossbar one-fourth down. Cross of the Pope, same as the cross of the Patriarch with the addition of a bar. Russian Orthodox Cross, like the cross of the Patriarch with a diagonal bar under it. Cross of Archangels, also called the Golgotha Cross, like the cross of the Patriarch with a bar at the base. Restoration Cross, perfectly square cross with a circle at the center. Greek Cross, also called St. George's Cross, perfectly square cross. Evangelist's Cross, cross bar at center with a gradated, with a gradated base of four bars, large to small. Cross of Christ, also called the Labarum, the Greek letters Chi, Rho, representing the first three letters of the word Christ. Death Cross, miniature cross of Peter, with the crossbars meeting close to the bottom at 45 degree angle. Crutch Cross, perfectly square cross with a one-fourth length base at each end. Crossed Cross, like the Crutch Cross with a small extension beyond bases at each end. Anchor Cross, a perfectly centered single line cross with V's at all four cross ends. Invocation Cross, consists of four perfectly square crosses unified to form a square with extended sides. Coptic Cross, also called the Egyptian Cross, a perfect circle at the top of a double barred cross. Ink, an elongated oval at the top of a long bottom bar and shortened crossbar. Sun Cross, a perfectly square cross in the middle of a circle. Inaugural Cross, I'm sorry, inaugural circle, a small circle inside the connected by cross bars to an outer circle. Cross of Philip, a Latin cross on its side with the crossbar on the right. Gamma cross, a cross formed by an outline of four L shapes facing different directions. Button cross, a perfectly squared cross with four small bulbous ends. Heraldic dagger, also called the pointed cross, a cross that looks like a short sword. Tally cross, also called St. Anthony's cross, a cross without a bar on top. Looks like a capital T. Ring cross, also called the Celtic cross, a Latin cross with an outer circle connecting all three ends of the crossbar. Lutheran cross, Latin cross with a small circle at the crossbar and crossbars at each end. Cross of St. John, like a four-leaf clover with a square connecting the four leaves. Maltese cross, a short and centered cross with concave ends at each crossbar base. Cross of Endlessness, an upended square with four triangles connecting on four sides. The pentagram, also called Solomon's seal, one line forming a five-pointed star encased in a circle. Tanit, named for a Phoenician lunar goddess, this symbol is comprised of a trapezium closed by a horizontal line at the top and surmounted in the middle by a circle. The shield of David, also called Star of David, two interwoven triangles, one pointing up and one down, forming a six-pointed star. St. Andrew's Cross, two lines meeting at the middle at 45 degree angles. Threefoil, also called Lazarus Cross, like the crossed cross with rounded ends and heavier lines. The Iron Cross, a larger version of the Maltese Cross 
with an outline and the center blackened. Square cross. An up-ended solid rectangle with a small cross on each side. Cross dissimulata. Similar to the ink with an anchor-like arc at the bottom. Portuguese cross. Like a Latin cross, but with flanged shaped end caps. Roman Holy Cross. A twelve ended maze of crossed bars with four dots at four ends. The Lily Cross. A circle outline with Y's at all four ends. The circle has continuity and infinity. The circle that constitutes the handle over the cross and completes the ink symbol has, like the cross, a very long and complicated history. Circular symbols have existed since the beginning of time and have come to have great significance in every culture around the world. The circle's continuous properties suggest eternity and the infinite, as well as regeneration and regrowth. The universal symbol for infinity is, in fact, a double circle made of one continuous line. The circle is most often associated with the sun, the most powerful object in the sky. The sun so often associated with the masculine in Western and Greco-Roman mythology is in many cultures also associated with the female. For instance, the Hindu great mother took the form of the sun as the goddess Aditi. The symbol of Venus with the circle at the top is also very close to the ink. Venus is, of course, the goddess of love. The deity and her associated symbol were thus often displayed and worn during the sexual revolution of the 60s. The circle is also seen as a symbol of fertility, as a representation of the womb. It is thus evocative of life and of the woman. The symbols in this section are the symbol for infinity, the left side, the ancient symbol for the sun, shared by both Hindu and Egyptian cultures, the right side, the well-known Venus of Willendorf, like most great mother goddesses, echoes this solar cir circle, the ink-like symbol of Venus. The ink as integration and union. The ink combining the traditionally masculine cross and the feminine circle or loop can be seen as a union of opposites, especially concerning gender. In Egyptian mythology, it is often associated with the gods Isis and Osiris. Kevin Saunders writes in Advanced Wiccan Spirituality, The loop at the top can be seen to represent the womb of the goddess, whilst the T-shape underneath is a phallus symbol representing the god. The Anks circular top portion represents the female, while its sheath-like cross represents the male. Together, these forces combine to symbolize life. The yank then represents the union of heaven and earth, of male and female, and more literally, the union of the two gods. It is also commonly known as a sexual symbol, especially in Egyptian art, where it was used to depict the public triangle. Hieros cross glufo. The first recorded use of the ink can be traced back to the most rudimentary forms of writing that developed in Egypt as far back as 3100 BC, when the Armenoid or Giza forces crossed the Nile Delta into Upper Egypt. The predominant system known today as hieroglyphics, Greek hieros or sacred, and glufo or sculptures, contains roughly 700 signs, though most of these have multiple meanings. Indeed, hieroglyphics is a phonogrammatic or sound-based language, meaning that many of its symbols, like the one that resembles an owl, connote both the literal representation, an owl, and a sound, in this case M. Hieroglyphics remained a mystery to modern scholars until 1799, when French soldiers stationed near the Nile Delta discovered the Rosetta Stone, an enormous basalt, steel inscribed with a single passage written in three languages, hieroglyphics, hieratic, and Greek. Scholars, understanding that these hieroglyphics were phonograms, or phonograms and not picto or ideograms, were able to decipher the language by comparing it to the Greek. 
By 1822, the hieroglyphic code had been cracked. One of the most important and widely used symbols in this early form of Egyptian writing is the ankh. Although no one knows the true origin of the symbol, some scholars believe that it is a representation of a sandal strap, which ancient Egyptians called ink. This word was the same consonants as those in the word for life. The ankh is often associated with Imhotep, a physician for the pharaoh's family, who lived around 3000 BC. After Imhotep's death, he became the god of medicine and healing in Egypt, and was often portrayed in conjunction with the ink symbol. There's something rather delightful about the idea that the glyph meaning life might have been modeled on something as common as a sandal strap, or which it is essentially a homonym. But what could be more common, more mundane than life? The illustration in this section is Imhotep portrayed with his tablet in his role as a physician. Chapter 2 Sacred Symbols of the Ancients Examples of inks abound in ancient art, especially in murals and wall paintings adorning ancient buildings and structures. When King Narmer, ruler of Upper Egypt, conquered Lower Egypt in 3000 BC and united the country, his first order of business was to initiate large-scale building projects all over the kingdom. Egyptian artists plastered houses, public buildings, and places of worship with massive paintings, mosaics, and decorative flourishes that comprise some of the most stunning examples of hieroglyphics in art. The ink can be found in just about every one. The illustration in this section is Thoth guiding the dead to receive the gift of life. The ink from Osiri. The ink in Egyptian art. The ink's overarching symbolism in Egyptian portrayals of gods and goddesses was as a harbinger of life, physical and eternal. In many Egyptian stele, gods or goddesses are depicted holding the ink to the lips or face of a pharaoh opposite, sometimes even blowing the symbol's divine energy towards him. The portrayal ever present in tombs was meant to ensure the king the everlasting breath of life. Atum, the sun god of Heliopolis, and Sekhmet, the lion-headed goddess of war, hold the ink along with a was on the walls of temples, signifying eternal life for the deceased in his or her next life. The was, a staff made from a dried bull's penis, symbolized power and dominion. In the tomb of the short-lived 8th king of the 18th dynasty, Thutmose the fourth, the gods Osiri, Anubis, and Hathor, are shown giving life to the deceased king. See facing page. And in King Sneferu's funerary temple, built in the 4th dynasty, the goddess Isis holds a dangling ankh from her hands, full of food and drink offerings. Many pharaohs were buried with ank amulets held close to their chests in hopes that they would help them to live well in their next lives. The symbol is also used in less literal contexts meant to evoke the essence of life in the larger theme of the painting or carving. In a limestone relief from 1345 BC called Akhenaten, Nefertiti and two daughters offering to the Aten, the Ankh is shown held by human hands radiating from the sun disk, symbolizing the sun's persistent life and strength. See facing page. On some temples in Upper Egypt, the Ankh symbolized purification, appearing as water in cleansing rituals. Thoth, the Egyptian moon god, was pictured pouring water, represented by falling Ankh symbols, over the king to cleanse him. In these cases, the ink is depicted as a physical object, an amulet or carving used as a tool, but the symbol is also frequently present as one among many hieroglyphics, comprising a background decoration. Egyptian artists were notoriously thorough, leaving no space touched. I'm sorry, no space untouched. They 
plastered their works with hieroglyphs that held special significance. Because of its positive connotation, the ink was a popular symbol that was used to adorn blank space. Some theories hold that the ink symbolized the sunrise, the loop emerging from the Tao's crossbar, representing the sun, heaven, and earth, the cross representing humankind. This duality is common among analyses of the ink, showing the active and passive existing simultaneously. Champdor, or Campdor, quoted in Jean Cavalier's The Penguin Dictionary of Sacred Symbols, writes, the phonetic significance of this sign is a combination of the signs for activity and passivity, and a mixture of the two, and conforms with the symbolism of the cross, in general as the synthesis of the active and passive principle. Here the ink serves as a reminder that we humans are not exactly in charge, and that we are certainly not the only energy in play in the universe. In order for there to be balance and harmony, there needs to be a balance of active and passive forces of action and reaction. In this sense, the ink can remind us that all life is balance. The illustrations in this section are Atum, the sun god with ink, and Was, from the tomb of Thutmose the fourth, Osiri, Anubis, and Hather giving life to the deceased king, Pharaoh. Akhenaten and his family adoring the Aten limestone relief showing the ankh, the ankh as a symbol of the sun's persistent life and strength. The Ankh as Sacred Object The Ankh was an important tool and sacred symbol for the gods, the goddesses of the cradle of civilization. Most are depicted in art holding an ankh. The divinities of Egypt and Mesopotamia used their anks as the insignia of their exalted stations, much as royalty use a staff or scepter, and magicians and modern witches wield their wands. Bast, the eye goddess, Hather, Hecate, Hermes, Hochma, Horus, Isis, Osiris, or Osiri, and others are all seen frequently with the ankh. Depictions of ancient divinities with anks are as widely various as the personalities of the gods and the goddesses themselves. Bast Bast is the cat goddess and the Egyptians' great protector. She has dominion over cats, childbirth, healing, passion, pleasure, joy, and happiness. She is associated with the element of fire. She is often portrayed wearing an ankh. There is an illustration of Bast in this section. I Goddess This ancient Mesopotamian deity was depicted simply as an all-seeing eye. No transgression could be concealed from her huge unblinking eye. After her first appearance in or before 3500 BC, the I Goddess eventually melded with Mary and possibly Mariana, a spirit once worshipped as Yahweh's companion. and interesting tidbit for Da Vinci Code fans. Her symbol is sometimes mistaken for the evil eye, which makes workers of mischief nervous and thieves think twice before committing a crime. As a birth giver, she promises eternal life. Hather Hather is the cow goddess, beloved in ancient Egypt for her ability to bring fertility, and thus life. She was also associated with royalty. Her priests were artists, singers, and dancers, as well as trained midwives and seers. As the celestial cow, she held her golden disc, the sun between her horns. Hather's other sacred animals include the lion, the cobra, the falcon, and the hippopotamus. The sacred sistrum, a rattle used in ritual, could be used to summon her. Mirrors are sacred to her in the tomb of Tutankhamun, his queen Ankhesanamun, holds a ritual object that depicts Hather holding an ink in each hand. And in this section is an illustration of Hather. Hecate. Hecate is a crone goddess. She shows her face in the dark of the moon. Hecate is the banisher. As the dark moon, she is also the goddess of divination and prophecy. Before Christianity, the Greek cross signified Hecate as the goddess of crossroads. 
like the infinity sign or the ink. This is also a representation of the union of male and female energies, vertical and horizontal members, respectively. In this section is an illustration of Hecate. Hermes. Hermes is associated with the Roman god Mercury, and also the Egyptian scribe god Thoth. Hermes is credited with the invention of alchemy, astrology, and several other occult sciences. Thrice great Hermes is also revered by Sufis, and is believed to be the wisest of all. He conducts the newly dead to the underworld. Early Christians and Gnostics saw Hermes as a precursor to Christ, a divine prophet, the revealer of mysteries and the giver of enlightenment. The Hermetic Cross of Christianity is an adaptation of the insignia of Hermes. He is frequently seen holding a sacred ankh, the symbol of the caduceus, which still represents modern medicine, is usually seen as a serpent entwined around an ankh. In this section we have an illustration of Thoth and an illustration of the caduceus. Chokhmah this goddess is the Holy Spirit, an ancient Hebrew version of the goddess of wisdom, the Gnostic Sophia. Chokhmah is also related to Egypt's Mat, mother of creative works of power from which the universe was formed. Bereshit, the very first word of Genesis, really refers to this goddess of wisdom. Bereshit is traditionally translated as in the beginning. Chokhmah appears often in pre-Christian and early Christian writing, and Philo of Alexandria described her as the spouse of Jehovah. King Solomon himself decreed that Chokhmah must be obeyed in the wisdom of Solomon, a chapter extracted from the Bible and established as apocryphal. Chokhmah's symbol, like that of Venus, is the dove, closely linked to Isis. Chokhmah is the mother of magical knowledge and is often depicted holding an ankh. The illustration in this, century, in this section is the 16th century illustration of Sophia, shows both the dove symbolism, the wings, of Hokma, as well as a distinct ankh-like composition. Mat also is portrayed as a woman with wings. In the afterworld, Mat weighs men's souls against a feather. Horus Horus is the Egyptian god of light and healing. He is the all-seeing eye, the child of Isis and Osiris. Horus is depicted with the head of a falcon and the body of a man. He and the other gods were often portrayed by the ancient Egyptians holding an ankh to Pharaoh's lips as an offering of the breath of life, an offering needed in the afterlife. In this section we have two illustrations. One is Horus, depicted here as completely falcon holds a shen ring similar to an ankh in each talon. The second illustration is Horus with the ankh and was. Isis. Isis is one of the most important aspects of the Greek goddess of Egypt. She could guarantee the immortality of the pharaohs, resurrecting them as she did Osiri. Isis worship spread and became an enormous cult that influenced even the Roman Empire. She has great appeal as a divine mother. Isis is the link between birth and death. She is the daughter of Nuit, the goddess of the sky, and the god of earth. She was worshipped by the ancients as the queen of heaven. Her name literally means throne, and the emblem worn on her head is a throne. In Egyptian art, Isis is portrayed in many aspects as a woman with wings, in a long sheath dress and crowned with the hieroglyphic sign for a throne, and often with a solar disk flanked by horns. Her symbol is the hieroglyph Tayat, life, which was also called the Knot of Isis. She is thus called Lady of Life, and is frequently portrayed holding the sacred ankh. The illustrations in this section are Horus on the left and Isis on the right, flanking Osiri. Second illustration is Isis nursing her son Horus. And the third illustration is the hieroglyph Tayat, meaning life. Osiri. Osiri is the god of life and death in the Egyptian pantheon. He takes care of the crops, the mind, the afterlife, and manners. 
Husband to Isis and father of Horus, Osiri is deeply connected to the cycles of growing and changing seasons. According to historian Barbara Walker, a bishop's crozier was in reality an Osirian shepherd's crook. The Christian cross itself was a variant of the Egyptian ankh. The, two il the only illustration in this section is an illustration of Osiri. Chapter 3. The Ankh Eternal the Coptic Church, the Christian Church of Egypt, adopted the Ankh, or Crux Ansata, as its emblem when it was formed in the first century. When St. Mark the Evangelist first preached the Gospel in Alexandria in A.D. 68, he began converting Egyptians to his brand of Christianity. The Ankh, ever present in Egyptian art, was familiar to many of the converts, and its likeness to the cross made it a fitting symbol for the Church. Its rounded loop evoking Jesus' crucifixion represented God's everlasting love and resembled an angel's halo. A later adaptation of the Coptic cross, sometimes called the handlebar cross, was drawn with an X inside the loop. Egyptians wore the tayat, an archaic form of the ankh that also resembles an angel for protection and power. Indeed, the Tayat's looped head and wing-like arms do resemble an angel, according to the Coptic Church. However, the symbol was intended to represent the vulva, or matrix of Isis, its wings representing menstrual blood radiating from her genitals. The Tayat is linked to the womb, and E.A. Wallace Budge writes in Egyptian language that it was supposed to bring to the wearer, living or dead, the virtue of the blood of Isis. The Jed, or Jed Pillar, also known as a tet column, is the symbol associated with Osiri. According to one of the texts in the Book of the Dead, the Jed pillar is the backbone of Osiri. It works in concert with the Tayat and is thought to represent the spinal column. Another symbol that incorporates elements of the Ankh is, not surprisingly, the sign of Osiri, shown on the left. The symbol's body is the Ankh, with arms that extend up from the cross holding the sun disk that, according to Barbara Walker in her The Woman's Encyclopedia of Myths and Sacred Symbols, came to represent Osiri Ra, both Heavenly Father and Dying and Resurrecting Son. That the Tayat, the Jed, the sign of Osiri, and the Ankh are very similar symbols is not surprising, since, as Budge observes, the ink was often seen as the key of the Nile, and was linked closely to the marriage of Osiri and Isis. After invading Egypt, the Romans adopted the ink and wove it into their own symbology and art. The Mirror of Venus symbol, used to represent Venus, the Roman goddess of love, shares many elements with the ink, both in form and significance. The rounded loop and straight base suggest Venus's hand mirror and evoke divine femininity. Indeed, like the ink, Venus is associated with ultimate femininity, sexuality, ultimate fertility, and all that is beautiful. The word veneration is derived from Venus, and she should be venerated, especially on her sacred day, Friday. The lore and mythology of Venus is well known as she has been imprinted on our consciousness as Botticelli's beautiful naked nymph on the half-shell, rising out of a foamy wave of the ocean. Her symbol, universally acknowledged as the botanical and zoological emblem of the female, dates back far beyond alchemical times, when it meant copper. Venus's major shrine was located on Cyprus, the island of copper, and Walker points out that she is sometimes called the goddess of copper. The labarum, a sign of the deity Mithra, is a late derivation of the Ankh symbol. Shaped like a wheel with a circular protrusion on one of its spokes, the labarum was perhaps meant to represent the wheel of the universe, with the sun disk peeking out. It was used as a forehead marking by Mithraic followers, and was believed to have been spotted in the sky by Constantine directly preceding the Battle of the Milvian Bridge. The illustrations in this section are a Coptic bust wearing the crux ansata, the Jed, the sign of Osiri, the Liberum, and that is it. The Ankh in Modern Culture The Ankh survives to this day as a ubiquitous symbol in popular culture. 
It has its place in nearly every tradition, but it is generally associated with particular subcultures. It is featured in everything from African-American weddings to Wiccan ceremonies to Gothic music. It is not uncommon to see the ink pictured or utilized as a theme in video games, on television, and in comic books. Generally associated with the arcane and the occult and commonly used as a symbol of everlasting life, it has taken on widely different meanings as it was woven into various contemporary cultures. Wicca Though not central to Wiccan ritual, the Ankh does play a role in Wiccan tradition. Some Wiccans use the Ankh as a sacred object and place it on their altars to represent life and to strengthen psychic powers. Ankh amulets and artifacts are often used in spells involving life, health, vitality, fertility, and divination. It is often used in conjunction with the major symbol of Wicca, the pentagram. Black Culture the Ankh is frequently seen in African American culture as well. It is used as a symbol of Afrocentrism and black pride, adorning necklaces, posters, and clothing that promote equality and the right to justice and freedom for everyone. It is probably no accident, of course, that this symbol connects modern day black Americans with their African heritage. The symbol also pops up on the altars in some African-American sacred ceremonies, such as the wedding described in Harriet Cole's Vows, the African-American couple's guide to designing a sacred ceremony. We were given permission by our spiritual elders to jump over the ankh and cross over together. We were each given our own ankh, which we wore on our left arms. We then gave each other a greeting of recognition as spiritual husband and wife. The illustration in this section is the Akuaba, an African fertility symbol, strongly resembles the Ankh. Rastafarian culture. The Ankh is also an extremely meaningful symbol in Rastafarian culture, where it represents not only life, but also the perfect 360 degrees of the cosmic life cycle. Life continues after death, and the Ankh affirms the continuity of existence. The Ankh connotes renewal, revitalization, and positive energy. It is present in Rastafarians' daily lives, as well as their sacred ceremonies. On the seventh day of Kwanzaa, the Ankh is used to symbolize Omani, or faith, reminding worshippers of the importance of community, people, and culture in everyday life. Hippie Culture When hippie culture hit its peak in the United States in the 1960s and 1970s, the Yank emerged as a popular emblem for free love, happiness, and freedom. Worn on necklaces, t-shirts, and as patches on blue jeans, the Yank was everywhere, its significance widespread. The Yank was so prominent that it was frequently referred to as the Hippie Cross. The photo depicted in this book shows Hippies wore the Ankh as a life-affirming sign and to show their belief that material life is not all there is. Gothic Culture Contemporary Gothic culture, or Goth, which often draws from paganism and related traditions, has used the Ankh as an emblem since its beginnings in the late 1970s or early 1980s. It is used widely in decoration and expression among those identifying with the Goth subculture. Anks can be found adorning clothing in stores that cater to the goth crowd, and it frequently pops up on record covers for goth bands. Perhaps there is some irony to the fact that the ankh symbolizes life, whereas its opposite, death, is a driving force in goth culture. In this context, the symbol is sometimes associated with vampires. Although the ankh as a symbol of immortality seems antithetical to vampirism, you can even find vampire ink necklaces for sale today, the symbol having been modified to emphasize its dagger or fang-like characteristics. Pop Culture The ink has even made its way into the popular Zeitgeist. It, like countless other Egyptian hieroglyphs, is a popular symbol in tattoos and is worn by many celebrities. In the music world, KISS guitarist Vinnie Vincent is rarely seen without an ankh symbol as part of his notorious makeup. The Swedish pop band Ace of Bass, in its video and cover art for the hit single The Sign, uses a derivation of the ankh as its emblem. Comic book artist Neil Gaiman 
uses the ink as a symbol of death in his hit comic book series, The Sandman. The symbol also appears in many popular video games. The powerful ink, it seems, will live on forever. This photograph inside this section is an elaborate modern tattoo incorporating the ink. Part 2. The Ink as a Living Symbol Chapter 4. The Ink as a Ritual Tool The ink is not merely a static symbol. Moreover, it never has been. Since ancient times, people have used inks in ritual and magic. In ancient Egypt, its properties were considered so beneficial that the hieroglyph was often crafted into three-dimensional amulets, or charms, to be worn as jewelry by the person wishing for protection. The illustration in this section is of the Ankh Jed and was ritual tools of the god Osiri. Consecrating and Charging Your Ankh If you are going to use the ink that comes with this book for ritual or magic, you must first consecrate it to imbue it with your personal energy, just as you would any ritual tool. Every time you acquire a new talisman or treasure, you can perform this simple consecration rite. 1. Choose a substance or object to represent each of the four elements, air, earth, fire, and water. I like to use incense for air, a candle for fire, a cup of water for water, and a bowl of salt for earth. Let your instinct guide you to choose substances and objects that inspire you. 2. Take the ink and pass it through the wafting, scented smoke of the incense and say, now inspired with the breath of air. 3. Pass the ink swiftly through the flame of the candle and say, Burnished by fire. 4. Sprinkle the ink with water and say, Purified by water. 5. Dip the ink into the bowl of salt and say, Empowered by the earth. 6. Hold up the ink with both hands before you, chant and imagine an enveloping, warm white light purifying it. Say, Steeped in spirit and bright with light. 7. Place the now cleansed ink upon your altar and say, By my hand, charged and charged, this ink I will use for the purpose of good in this world. I hereby consecrate this tool. By performing this ritual, you inculcate your ink with the magic that lives inside of you. You instill it with your energy. You can wear the ink as a talisman, or store it on your altar, or in your sacred space. It will become a source of power for you, and will magnify the ceremonial strength of your ritual work. You can also utilize colors, crystals, essential oils, incenses, and herbs for your own astrological sign and moon signs in your consecration ritual, or invoke a specific goddess or deity for whom you feel an affinity. The more associations you learn and use, the more your effectiveness will grow. Your ink as amulet or talisman. You can also use your ink as either an amulet or a talisman. Amulets date back to the earliest human cultures, the word itself deriving from the Latin word for defense. Pliny subscribed to the use of amulets and wrote about the three common kinds used by the Romans of the classical age. The ancient Egyptians depended heavily on their amulets, and many are still preserved in the cases of museums from burial displays. Wealthier denizens of the Nile, royalty, and the priestly class all wore precious and semi-precious gems and crystals as amulets. amulets excuse me. Lapis lazuli was perhaps the most revered of these stones. A lapis lazuli, Eye of Horus, was considered particularly powerful, as were scarabs which symbolized rebirth, frogs, which symbolized fertility, and the ink, which symbolized eternal life. Though many people confuse the two, talismans and amulets are not the same. Amulets provide passive protection from harm, evil, or negativity. Talismans, on the other hand, have active transformative powers. For example, the supernatal a supernatural sword Excalibur was imbued with the supremacy by the Lady of the Lake so that it gave King Arthur magical powers. A talisman can be any object or symbol that you believe has magical properties, but its powers must derive from nature or be brought to the object through ritual. The illustration in this section is of the Eye of Horus. 
Heavy Metal Magic Choosing the right chain for your Ankh necklace can help determine its power. Chains of all kinds have been long favored by pagans as sacred symbols, because they represent links between people, the ties that bind you to others. Chains can also be mystical expressions for happiness and justice, prayer, reason, and the soul, communication, and command. Plato referred to a chain of being, a golden chain linking earth to the heavens above, a bond between humans and the immortals. Socrates tied our human happiness to the concept of justice with an imagined chain of steel and diamonds. Pseudo Dionysius, the Areopagite, compared the practice of prayer to an infinitely luminous chain reaching from earth to heaven. In some traditions, an astral cord akin to a golden chain binds the spirit to the psyche, or reason to the soul. An Ankh necklace is thus literally your link to eternal life. The ink that comes with this book hangs from a silken cord. You can enhance the power of your ink, however, by hanging it from a chain. Moreover, you can refine those powers by varying the metal of its chain. Here's a little user's guide to the meaning and magic of precious metals. Gold Gold is beloved for its sheen and purity. It is also a fantastic energy conductor in either its white or yellow form. An ink hung on a golden chain is empowered with a dose of quickening energy and becomes a symbol of wealth and personal power. Gold never tarnishes and seems to stay beautiful and perfect despite surrounding conditions. It is impermeable to weather and to damage from age. It is also a viable energy conductor and has wonderful healing properties. It has been used to treat arthritis since it is impervious to harm. Gold carries tremendous powers for renewal and regeneration. In Mexico, gold is linked to religion and faith. Gold, crucifixes, and crosses are worn for protection and as a link to God, Christ, and Mary. Parents in India give their young children tiny gold amulets to guard them against harm and illness. An ink on a gold chain is powerful indeed. Silver Silver is aligned with the planet and the god Mercury. It represents communication and has been associated with the moon for thousands of years. As such, it is a stabilizer of other crystals or gems. Although it doesn't add to the energy of a stone, it secures that energy and gives it very important support. Silver is a healing metal that should not be worn all the time. Let your body tell you when it feels right. Silver offers a reflection of your self-esteem. It is also a detoxifying agent and communicates with the body to alert it about raised levels of hormones and other chemical imbalances. Silver is good to wear as a necklace, as it is very beneficial to the throat and lungs. A silver chain is an excellent choice for this talisman. Copper Copper is the metal worn most consciously to heal as evidenced by the many copper bracelets you see on wrists. Healers place their faith in copper's power to heal the body and mind based on its power as a conductor. Copper aids the mineral content of gems and crystals to interact with your body. One school of thought propounds the belief that a crystal wand wrapped with copper is superpowered. Copper reacts best with stones containing a lot of metal. It reacts very little with stones that lack metal or in their makeup. Tiger's Eye, Aventurine, Rhodonite, and Mika are metal-rich stones that combine their energies beautifully with copper. Do not place most crystalline stones in copper, however. The same holds true for pearls and coral. Amethyst is only is one of the only crystalline stones that combine well with copper. Copper also cooperates with gold and silver. A multi-metal necklace for your ink can make it a powerful tool for healing. Copper is found around the world and has been utilized since ancient times for tools, for decoration, and for jewelry. Copper plays a significant role in the cultures of prehistory. Ancient Greece and Rome Native America, India, and Egypt, as well as China and Japan. 
copper ha was believed to protect against evil and attract love. The Egyptians relied upon it for their ritual of the dead. Copper has been commonly used throughout history in sacred knives, candle holders, in early churches, Asian copper prayer diagrams, purification vessels, and countless other holy instruments. An ink of copper with lapis lazuli is a wonderful way to connect with the wisdom of the ancient Egyptians. Copper stimulates the flow of energy throughout your body and your mind. It can raise your personal energy. Anyone who suffers from lethargy or lethargy should wear copper to get out of their rut. Copper is believed to be a helpmate to the blood, soft tissue, the immune system, the metabolism, and the mucous membranes. It is claimed to have positive effects on self-esteem, to promote feelings of freedom and possibility, to enhance communication skills, and to act as a purifier. Copper gives confidence, and quite frankly, who could ask for anything more? Copper is ruled by Venus and attracts love, especially if set with emerald. It is a lucky metal, twice as lucky if it contains cat's eye, coral, opals, and Apache tears. Copper jewelry has immense healing properties, and if worn on the left side of the body, can actually prevent sickness. Bear this in mind if you choose a chain with any kind of copper on it for your ink necklace. Brass Brass is made by combining copper and zinc. Healers favor it as a detoxifier, a blood cleanser, and for use by people who actually have too much metal in their bloodstream. It has been used successfully to treat hair loss. Brass is often used as a shiny substitute for the much more costly gold. It is also a strengthening ally for the body. The ancients loved placing their gems in brass because it made the beautiful colors really stand out. Brass is also a wealth attractor. For this reason, some brass on your ink chain may be a good choice. Bronze Bronze is also an alloy of zinc and copper. It has much the same healing power as brass, with one exception. Bronze is said to give greater strength of character. It can help you conceive of an and achieve your goals. Wear some bronze on your ink necklace if you are starting a new project. Platinum. Platinum is an extremely precious metal that can make a very special setting for your ink. Be sure to give careful consideration to what crystals you place into a platinum setting, as they need to have an energy that can stand up to the high energy of this metal. Diamonds have a strong enough brilliance and are enhanced in their power in this way, as are rubies, tourmaline, sapphires, and emeralds. Your ink as an altar piece. When you're not wearing your ink necklace, you can place it on an altar. If you don't already have an altar, you can set one up for a specific intention, to attract love, to heal a relationship, and incorporate the ink into it for its power to create and bring wisdom. Your altar can be your touchstone for daily conjuring and contemplation. It is a place of peace and meditation, adorned with your treasured objects and the tools of your practice. It is a place of extreme focus where you can make magic. The illustration in this section is of Nephthys and Isis at right in praise of the Jed and Ankh, which together form the sign of Osiri. Positioning your Ankh. Choose a place for your altar where you won't be disturbed. Then choose the objects for your altar lovingly and intentionally. I recommend you place your altar facing north which has long been held to be the origin of primordial energy. North is also the direction of midnight, and an altar oriented in this fashion promises potent magic. Your altar should always be pleasing to the eye, and ultimately reflective of your personal energy. Take a low table or an old chest and paint it a color that you love. Feel free to get really creative. If black and red are your power colors, paint it black and red. Inscribe and decorate the base with symbols that are significant to you. For an altar that holds your ink as its focal point, you may want to use other Egyptian symbology, such as a statue of Bast, a pair of Isis-like wings, or a chunk of the lovely bluestone lapis lazuli. Next, place a favored fabric over your altar, table, or chest. 
Optimally, you should have an array of altar cloths, flowers, candles, and stones in different colors depending on the type of spell you intend to cast. Here is a color energy guide so you can change accordingly. Table 1. Traditional Wiccan Color Correspondences. Color and Correspondence. Red. Life. Lust. Pink. Love. Romance. Green. Prosperity. Friendship. Healing. Gray. Protection. White. Purity. Beginnings. Blue. Loyalty. Creativity. Vision. Orange. Higher Knowledge. Enlightenment. Purple. Spirituality. Yellow. Power and Fame. Table 2. Goth Magical Color Associations. Color and Association. Black. Absorption of Negative Energy. Divination, Banishing, Protection, and Binding. Silver. Intuition, Psychism, Balance, Spirituality, Goddess Energy. Red. Lust, Fire, Passion, Strength, Anger, Power, Courage. Next, take two candles and place them on the two farthest corners of the altar. Then place fresh flowers at the center of the space. Place your ink and your incense burner in front of the flowers. If you don't yet have a preferred incense, begin with the ancient essence of frankincense. Remember, the ink, as well as any ink-shaped stone, represents the key to life, and will thus symbolize creativity, wisdom, and fertility. Select other objects for your altar that appeal to you symbolically. A goddess figure like Isis, a photo you love of your favorite statue, or an iridescent abalone, seashell, you found one night on the beach, perhaps. If possible, place your birthstone on the altar, or a crystal, or stone you treasure. If there are cherished mementos you want to display, do so. Include anything you feel adds good energy and represents your singular vibration. Choosing Shapes Shapes have their own kind of power, so if you are placing stones or other objects on your altar, make sure you know what energy you are summoning your way. The following list can help you choose. Diamond-shaped stones, wealth and abundance said to attract riches. Round stones, the universe and the goddess, these stones are symbols of spirituality and connection to the universe. Round rocks and gems are about the feminine and pregnancy, of course. Round crystals can be used in all love spells and drawing or attraction, attraction, attraction actions. Heart-shaped stones. Love energy. Promote self-love and romance. Pyramid-shaped stones. Build energy upward towards the top. We know someone who keeps a beautiful little malachite pyramid on her computer simply because she loves to look at it. But when, she, when the need arises, she can place a dollar bill underneath it and visualize positive money energy flowing out of the stone. You can use many stones on your altar in this way, because you love to look at them, and for their power. Rectangular Stones and Crystals God Energy In addition to representing male energy and the phallus, this shape is symbolic of energy itself and of electrical currents. These stones are great for love and sex spells. This longer and thinner shape also denotes protection. Egg-shaped stones. Creativity. New ideas come to anyone wearing an egg-shaped crystal. Triangular stones. Guardian stones. They protect the wearer. Square stones. Our earth harboringers of plenty and prosperity. Human body shaped stones bring good energy to the body part depicted and strengthen that area. Clusters, one of the most common natural crystal forms. They bring balance and harmony into your life. Obelisks, four sided pyramids, wonderful energy activators. Obelisks are manifestors. Write your wish down on paper and place it beneath an obelisk to bring your hopes into reality. Octahedrons. Eight-sided objects. They bring order to chaos and are great for analysis and organization. The octahedron is also terrific for healing. Carry an octahedron crystal in your pocket if you are unwell so you can feel better soon. 
Holes that have formed naturally in any of these stones shapes are very auspicious and magical. If you look through the holes by the light of the moon, you may see visions and spirits. Preparing your altar. Now that you have chosen your sacred space and placed your treasured objects on it, you're ready to prepare your altar for use. 1. Purify the space by smudging or burning a bundle of sage over it. 2. Anoint your third eye, the center of your forehead, with a scented essential oil like the sacred resin amber, or one that especially pleases you. 3. Anoint the candles with the same essence. 4. Light the candles and meditate in a prayerful way upon all the positive and practical magic you will create at your Ankh altar. Chapter 5. The Ankh as a Prayer Bead no matter what your spiritual practice, making and using prayer beads can be a good way to focus your meditations and intentions. Almost all religious and spiritual traditions have incorporated some kind of beads, whether to help the user remember certain events, to focus attention away from worry and anxiety, or to focus attention on a specific outcome. See pages 72 through 74 for the list of special stones and colors. Prayer beads with an ankh amulet are easy to make and make nice gifts. As long as you feel your friend will truly benefit and is aware of the special qualities and power of your gift. Select a crystal that is endowed with the energy you want to call. Hold it in the palm of your hand until it is warm from your touch. Then do visualization about the gift the stone is offering. Wear your ink amulet as a pendant or tuck your personal prayer beads in your pocket or pur purse for a guardian to go. Here is a list of stones from which you can choose for the specific kind of safeguard you want to invoke. Amber, one of the oldest of talismans. It has great power for general safety. Jade, offers protection, especially for children, and guards their health. Jade also creates prosperity power. Chrysolite, drives away evil spirits and aids peaceful sleep, especially if set in gold. Jasper, reputed to be a defense against the venom of poisonous insects and snakes. Bloodstone, lucky, good to wear during travels. Turquoise, believed to be great for a horse's gait if affixed to the bridle. Amethyst, helps with sobriety by preventing inebriation. Emerald, cancels out the power of any magician. Moonstone, a boon to travelers brings fortune and fame. Jet helps expel negativity when set in silver. Diamond as a necklace brings good fortune should always touch the skin. This dazzling stone works best when received as a gift. It lends force and valor. Aquamarine good to wear if you want to attract wisdom or have fear of water and drowning. It guards against malevolent spirits. Carnelian is to the devil as garlic is to the vampires. Keeps them away. Some stones just don't mix. A word to the wise. Some stones shouldn't be used together as prayer beads, as their energies cancel each other out. So be careful about using the following combination of stones. Carnelian cancels out amethyst, as it connects more strongly with the body. Lapis lazuli stimulates the mind, while blue lace agate relaxes it. Lapis lazuli and turquoise have opposite effects, although this didn't stop the Egyptians. Turquoise dampens the energy of malachite. Diamonds and turquoise have such different properties that they conflict. The illustration in this section is the well-known death mask of Tutankhamun is inlaid with a treasure trove of precious stones including carnelian, lapis lazuli, and turquoise. Chapter 6. The Ankh as a Pendulum A pendulum is a tool for gleaning information from your inner self. It is one of the easiest and most fun methods of divination. Ankh necklaces make wonderful pendulums. First, however, you must charge the Ankh pendulum. See pages 53 through 54. Next, determine which movements will correspond to which answers. Then all you have to do is ask a question and your ink pendulum will show you the answer. The pendulum will swing up and down, giving you answers through its movements. Many people depend heavily, 
heavily on their pendulums for help with shopping and all manner of decision makings. We recommend that you keep a journal of your work with the pendulum. Not only will this give you a record, it will help you track the effectiveness of your magic work. By reviewing your journal, you will be able to see patterns of information emerging from your unconscious and from the universe. You will learn so much about yourself and your place in the world from this. The illustration in this section, Nefertiti with the knot of Isis on her crown. Conclusion As we have seen, the ankh has established itself as a common symbol in cultures around the world. But why has this ancient Egyptian symbol come to mean so much to so many people in so many cultures? How does it bridge the gap between so many diverse traditions? The answer lies in the symbol's form, its significance, and its origins. One of the only common traits among every human being is the desire for life, health, vitality, and fertility. Everyone wants to live longer, happier, and healthier lives. The symbolism of the Ankh speaks to this desire, and so speaks to every culture. It adapts itself easily to a wide range of beliefs and traditions. Rastafarian, feminist, Christian, Hindu, and Wiccan. It expresses for us all the same essential themes, longevity, power, love, and life. The final illustration of Oz with the names Amenophis III and T. Amenhotep is written in the cartouche on the left. Bibliography Arian Angelus, Signs of Life, New York, Tarcher, 1998. Buckland Raymond, Signs, Symbols, and Omens, An Illustrated Guide to Magical and Spiritual Symbolism. Woodbury, Maine, Levelin, 2003. Budge, E.A. Wallace, Egyptian Language, Easy Lessons in Egyptian Hieroglyphics, London, Keegan Paul, Trench, Trubner, and Co., 1910. Serlo, J.E., A Dictionary of Symbols, Mineola, New York, Dover Publications, 2002. Cole, Harriet and George Chinsey, Vows, The African-American Couples, Guide to Designing a Sacred Ceremony, New York, Simon and Shuster, 2004. Gaiman, Neal, The Absolute Sandman, New York, Vertigo, 2006. Gearbrandt, Allen and John, Buchanan Brown, The Penguin Dictionary of Symbols, New York, Penguin, 1997. Harris, Eleanor L., Ancient Egyptian Divination and Magic, Boston Wiser Books, 1998. Lungman, Carl G., Dictionary of Symbols, New York, Norton, 1994. Mercatante, Anthony, Who's Who in Egyptian Mythology, New York, Metro Books, 2002. Saunders, Kevin, Advanced Wiccan Spirituality, Revitalizing the Roots and Foundation, Somerset, UK, Green Magic, 2004. Spearstra, Karen and Joel Spearstra. Hunab, Ku, 77 Sacred Symbols for Balancing Body and Spirit, Berkeley, California, The Crossing Press, 2005. Walker, Barbara, The Woman's Encyclopedia of Myths and Secrets, San Francisco, California, Harper and Rowe, 1983. Credits. Page 8. The Goddess Isis Painted Mural, C. 1360 B.C. Karnak Museum, Netherlands. This reproduction is part of a collection of reproductions compiled by the York Project. Compilation Copyright, The York Project, 2002. Permission to reprint is licensed under the GNU Free Documentation License, GDFL. Page 2. Detail of a mural at Abu Simbel, tomb of Queen Nefertari, in the Valley of the Queens. This photograph was one of the many taken by Eckhart Ritter, March 1963, and published in Nefertari, a documentation of her tomb and its decoration. Graz, Austria. Akademisch Druku, Verlaxanstalt, 1971. Introduction by Gertrude Felsing. Commentary by Hans Godick. Reprinted under the Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 2.5 license. CC by SA 2.5. As a faithful reproduction of a two dimensional work in the public domain. Page 3. Wall mural of Nefertari in her Abu Simbel Temple photograph. Copyright Jills Reynold. Permission to reprint is licensed under the terms of GFDL. Page 6. 
4th Century Architectural Coptic Cross, photograph, copyright Lewis Dingley, 2006, reprinted by permission from Dingley Image Collection. Page 9. Left, Moses leading his people out of Egypt, copyright Jupiter Images. Right, the Serpentine Cross sculpture entitled The Brazen Serpent Monument. Sits atop Mount Nebu, Jordan. The sculpture was created by Italian artist Giovanni Fantoni and is symbolic of the bronze serpent created by Moses in the wilderness. Numbers 21, 4 through 9. Permission to reprint is granted by the phot photographer and under the Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 2.0 license, CC by SA 2.5. Page 22, Venus of Wildendorf, is part of the collection of the Nature Historics Museum in Vienna. Photograph, copyright, Matthias Cabell, 2007. Permission to reprint granted under GFDL and CC by SA 2.5. Page 25. Statuette of Imhotep, Chancellor of the to the Pharaoh, Priest of Ra, and Architect, Bronze, Ptolemaic, Egypt, 332-30 through 30 BC, in the Egyptian collection of the Musée du Louvre, Paris. Photographed by Hu Totia. Permission to reprint is granted by the photographer and is licensed under the GDFL. Page 26. Egyptian steel from Musée du Louvre. Photograph copyright Golame Blancard, 2004. Permission is to reprint is granted by the photographer and is licensed under the GDFL and CC by SA 2.5. Page 28. Atom. This image was first published in first or second edition of Nordisk Familie Bok, Swedish Encyclopedia, 1904 through 1926. Page 29. Wall mural from the tomb of Thutmos IV, Valley of the Kings, Luxor, Egypt. Photograph, copyright, Hajar, 2002. Permission to reprint is granted by the photographer and is licensed under the GDFL. Page 31. Pharaoh Akhenaten and his family adoring the Aten. Limestone relief, Amarna period, copyright, oh no, circa 1350, Berlin Museum. This reproduction is part of a collection of reproductions compiled by the York Project. Compilation copyright, copyright, the York Project 2002. Permission to reprint is licensed under the GDFL. Page 33, a statuette of Bast in the Department of Egyptian Antiquities, Musée de l'Ouvre. Paris. Photograph. Copyright. Julian Blankert, 2004. Permission to reprint is granted by the photographer and is licensed under the GDFL. Page 34. Bust of Hather. Luxor. Museum. Egypt. This reproduction is part of a collection of reproductions compiled by the York Project. Compilation copyright. Copyright. The York Project, 2002. Permission to reprint is licensed under the GDFL. Page 35. Right. Hecate by Stephen Mallarme in Les Dieux Antiquis, Nouvelle Mythologie is Illustrui, Paris, 1880. Left, Thoth, the ibis headed god of knowledge, closely related, if not equivalent, to Hermes Trismegistus. This illustration is from Wilkinson's Manners and Customs of the Ancient Egyptians, New York, 1878. Page 36, Sophia from the Book of Wonders, by Davis, David Jors, 16th century. Page 37, Amulet representing Horus as a ram-headed falcon, ancient Egypt, 254 BC, 26th year of the reign of Ramses II. Found in the tomb in the Serapium at Memphis. Gold, lapis, turquoise, and cornelian. Department of Egyptian Antiquities, Musée de Livier, Paris. Photograph copyright, Julian Blankard, 2004. Permission to reprint is granted by the photographer and is licensed under the GDFL. Page 38, Illustration of Horus, copyright Jupiter Images. Page 39, Isis, Osiris, and Horus. Gold, lapis, and red glass, 874 through 850 BC, 22nd Dynasty. Department of Egyptian Antiquities, Musée du Louvre, Paris. Photograph, copyright, Julian Blankard, 2004. Permission to reprint is granted by the photographer and is licensed under the GDFL. Pages 40 through 41, line drawings of Isis and Osiri, were published in 1888 in Mayer's 
Conversations Lexicon. Page 42, Coptic Bust. This is one of the best examples of the Egyptian origin of the cross as a symbol. Photograph copyright 2005 by Alan Siliphant from a private collection in California, reprinted by permission from Alan Siliphant. Page 48, Russian Rainbow Gathering. Nazitino, August 2005. Photograph, copyright, Alex Kahn, 2005. Permission to reprint his license under the CC by SA 2.5. Page 49, Tattoo of Ankh on Woman's Back, Copyright Jupiter Images. Page 52, The Ankh, Jed, and Was, Ritual Tools of the God Osiri, from a collection of Jed Pillars, Musée National, Alexandria, Egypt. Photograph copyright Gerard Dutcher. Permission to reprint is licensed under the CC by SA 2.5. Page 63, Nephthys and Isis, in praise of Ankh and Sunwheel, from the Book of the Dead. Originally, created by the Egyptian writer Ani, C.A., 30, 1300 B.C., used by permission from Nergal and reprint licensed under GDFL. Page 74, Death Mask of Tutankhamun. Part of the traveling exhibit, Tutankhamun and the Golden Age of the Pharaohs, which began in 2004, I mean in 2005, and will return in Egypt in 2008. Photograph copyright Robbers, 2007. Permission to reprint and license under CC by SA 2.5. Page 76. Bust of Nefertiti in the Egyptisches Museum, Berlin. Photograph. Copyright Magnus Mansky, 2005. Permission to reprint is granted by the author under the terms of the GDFL. Page 78. Fayance Vaz in the Egyptian Antiquities Department of the Musée de Levure. This reproduction is part of a collection of reproductions compiled by the York Project. Compilation Copyright Copyright the York Project 2002. Permission to reprint is licensed under the GDFL.